so our first speaker today is Matt Edwards, um, Chief Executive of the Thackeray Museum of Medicine. Um, Matt's going to give us an overview of Thackeray's regeneration and give us a general welcome to the museum. Matt has over 34 years working in the sector, including running Glasgow's Open Museum, bringing the John Murray Archive to Edinburgh, and creating the Robert Burns Birthplace Museum. So I'd like to invite Matt up now. Thank you. Thank you. I always cringe a little bit. I don't know. I, I don't know why I cringe because you asked me to give you a bio and I wrote that. And <laughs> when, I, when, when I hear thirty-four years, it just makes me feel oh, so so old. Why am I still working in museums after thirty-four years? There must be there must be something. There must be something about them that's worthwhile. I'm trying to remember the last time I spoke to a social history curator this group, but I think it was in nineteen ninety-four or something like that. So, so thank you for having me back. It's really nice. Most of you weren't born when, when I last met you, uh, but I'm probably just going to bag on about the same old stuff. But it, it, in a way, that's important. I wanted to take a, a minute to, you know, where we are, who we are, and how we think is is, is very important. It, it, it affects our practice. And I think when I was thinking about talking about Thackeray and our, our approach to the museum, obviously it's a, it's a collective effort. And a lot of what I want to talk to you about is the underpinning, if you like, theory of change that we developed, uh, which which sort of everything in, 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 in the museum and its development throughout of. But also, you know, we all bring, uh, you know, ethics, ideologies, beliefs, personalities, all sorts of things to, to, to any project. And I think quite a lot of my thinking, especially after 34 years of working in museums, is shaped sort of more and more by a piece of text which sticks with me, which is from Paolo Gieri's, you know, wonderful seminal book about education called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. I'm sure some of you have read it, others it's a bit out of fashion now. It uses a lot of terminology from the sort of late 60s and early 70s, which you know, we don't talk about oppression much anymore. We talk about underserved communities and marginalized communities and underrepresented people, things like that. I think it's still quite a good, it's quite a good uh, term because it's about people being denied access to power and access to money uh, and access to full participation in society. Uh, and, it, and it's, it's a very material term. But in, in that, he talks about the tendency of what he calls the oppressor class, but you can probably just call that the middle class. It? It, it talks about the tendency of the oppressor class to not really like the fact that oppression goes on and to want to do something about oppression. It says, but the problem is, because most people from the oppressor class have a kind of, you know, they've been trained from birth to think that they've got the answers to everything. So they want to jump in and, and, and do something to fix things. And he said in there, he said, that, you know, a single act done with the oppressed is worth a thousand in their name. And that's something which has really stuck with me because I've been working in museums for 34 years. And for a large part of that time, my practice has been about uh, trying to involve communities and trying to develop partnerships and trying to do co-creation in one form or another and to try and change organizations. And some of lots of other people, and the, you know, the, the, the language of access and the language of participation has become more and more and more the kind of lingua franca of franca of our of our sector, and at the same time, the sector hasn't really changed, and it's 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 been left behind by other sectors. You know, look at IT, look at health, look at finance, look at everything else. You'll see more diverse, more participatory, more meritocratic, uh, less oppressive sectors than our own. So um, maybe we're missing something, and that's why. That's why the theory of change is important. It's why it's, it's something that I've, I've put quite a lot of effort into with the Thackeray Museum, but very, very quickly because I've got a tendency to talk too much. So. Uh, also, you're gonna see a lot of me and my colleague Ruth today, because we're gonna be doing tours inside and outside. And by the end of the day, you'll be sick to your team <laughs> and the sides of it. So this is the honeymoon period. I'm not, not gonna spoil it, spoil it uh, too much. Very, very quick history of this institution. I think mean, you're all historians, you've probably have known this uh, already anyway. But the, um, there's, there's two strands of history which are important. One of them is the Charles Thackeray Medical Supplies Company, which started, it was started by tradesmen in, in Leeds um, in, in, in 1902, really a corner shop pharmacy, uh, which happened to be strategically very well placed near to the School of Medicine and near to Leeds uh, uh, Infirmary. And as a result, the you know, entrepreneurial Leeds traders who, who set it up were able to develop some very um, sort of commercially productive relationships with surgeons and clinicians, and medical students. And it became the kind of go-to place 
for the medical students to go and buy their scalpels or whatever. But also it, it, it became a place where the discussion and improvement of medical supplies would be happening between the company and between surgery staff. A couple of things happened to, 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 to give the company a leg up. One was the First World War came along and they got some government contracts, as many people did at the time, to supply on a large scale medical supplies. So they were producing and supplying dressings, mainly wound dressings, during the First World War. And the big injection of cash that that brought in allowed them to develop a manufacturing arm. And through the interwar period, they really developed as manufacturers of medical supplies. <coughs> Until by, by the time you get to when the company was sold in the late 80s, uh, they've they become an international uh, leading supplier of medical supplies, a very wealthy company. They're, 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 um, the, the, the company is still there, it's now called Depew Sits, uh, and it, it produces hip um, prosthetics, knee prosthetics, incredible technologies for remote navigation of surgery, all sorts of things. And it's a big employer in Leeds. And in fact, the health tech business in Leeds is really important. So there's, there's an important bit of history in there. The, the museum itself, its origin is from trade, from lay uh, speciality. It hasn't come out of any of the the medical colleges or the surgical colleges or so on or any of the universities and that makes it reasonably reasonably unique in in the kind of sector of medical museums in in uh, in the uk and it also has collaboration sort of built into it if you like into its dna when when, when the company was sold um one of the directors was very interested in the history of medical supplies. He had a big personal collection, but also the company had a big collection which had been built up. And he got together with an important uh, figure in the history of the museum, who was a, a physician called Monty Lazowski, who was, um, if anybody's old enough to remember the old Jimmy's documentary about this site, uh, St. James's Hospital, he was Russell Harty's physician and featured in that quite a lot. And he was quite a sort of leading medical educator and, 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 and physician in, in uh, Leeds at the time. And Monty Lazowski had, had education at his heart. He'd set up really the, the teaching hospital as, as a teaching hospital. And he and Paul Thackeray conceived of a museum about the history of medical supplies, which from day one was educational and had the curriculum needs built into it. So very collaborative. Uh, Paul Thackeray, by personality, was a collector of the old school, but also a very devout Christian and had a very sort of deep kind of ethical view uh, about the value of the museum. Monty Lazowski was a Jewish immigrant who made good, came from a very poor East End of London background and was all into the power of medicine to improve people's lives and to bring people out of poverty and into, uh, you know, into, into, uh, wider society so you know you, you could say that unusually for any museum really some of those values were, were built in even if they might be traditional in their articulation they were built into the, the beginning and the origins of, of the museum it was always seen as something with a social purpose but by accident really it ended up here and this is the other part of the story which is very very important when they were looking for a home for the museum and so the museum trust was founded in the early 90s um, it took them a few years to find a home and then to fit it out. Um, this building became available. It was no longer up to fit for purpose for St. James's Hospital. It was an old, uh, old wing of the hospital. But what it was more importantly was the original workhouse infirmary from which the, the hospital developed. Very important for the history of the, the, the hospital, very, very important for the history of public health in Leeds. Leeds Union Workhouse, it was built late uh, 1850s, opened in 1860. And it was part of a major investment in public health around the whole of this area, which we'll have a look at a bit later. If any of you still have energy, at the end of the day, we're gonna go out and have a walk around the, um, the cemetery over, over the road and have a bit of chat about place uh, as, as well and, and, and how it all links together. So almost by accident, the museum came here because it was a spare space. It had a, it had a medical kind of connection it had the connection of Monty Lazowski, who was able to negotiate with the hospital a peppercorn rate. So we've got a hundred year lease. We pay like, you know, tuppence a year, if that. Um, and we get as much steam from the uh, distributed district steam heating system as we want to heat the place. So, you know, thanks, Monty. Um, 
uh, and, and that's why we're here. But actually, that location has taken on an enormous meaning to us over the years, and it's something that I was very keen as well to reflect when we when we sort of started to develop a kind of theory of change for the museum, which would shape the delivery of its regeneration. We already had planned the refurbishment museum before I came here. I was I was in a lovely position where a lot of funding, like seventy five percent of the funding was in place and so on, which was great. But I think it'd be fair to say, like a lot of capital projects, it started to get overcomplicated and it started to feel like there were a few bumps and a few things that needed to be sorted out. And often what happens, we find, you know, you get brought into a project. This has happened to me a lot in my career. And there's a big ambition to do something, but people have started to get lost in the detail. And just the problems of contracts and dealing with suppliers and procurement and, you know, and all of the funders' um, requirements. And it starts to just become a white noise that gets in the way of, of the purpose of why you're doing things. So one of the things I wanted to do when I come, came here was just sort of step back a bit and say, well, you know, what, what's the point of, of the museum? This is a picture of the, I hate the word inmates because they weren't really inmates, but that's the sort of common parlance. This is the able-bodied inmates of the Leeds Union workhouse from, from, from sort of just after it was built, all looking very happy and overjoyed to be there. And it's interesting as well, just looking at the people there as what was classified as, 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 as able-bodied as well, which is quite interesting. Um, but, you know, in a way, this, this photo isn't quite as, as it's, it's maybe, you shouldn't take it on face value. I mean, for a start, people had to stay quite still to, to be photographed, so they all look miserable in photographs from that time. But actually, the, the, the workhouse, when it was built, and if you look at the back-to-back -back housing around, which you can still see just out the window, around the area, it was overcrowded, it was dirty, it was full of disease. Um, uh, the workhouse was a big, open, airy building, which you could come to for respite. It was a rather nice place to be. And then there was a beautiful, you know, well laid out with geometric cons uh, grounds in front of the um, in front of the workhouse between here and the cemetery, which is now our car park, which would have been a very, very pleasant place to be. And talking to workhouse historians, you know, there's lots of evidence that people when they were in the end, it, it, when they were in the workhouse, didn't necessarily follow all the rules of the workhouse. You know, people would be sneaked in and out. Yeah. And, things, booze will be snaked and out of people. Up until there, there, was a, there was a change to legislation, but especially early on in the workhouse history, actually the food was pretty good. The, the cooking was quite, you know, it wasn't just all gruel and, and stale crust and so on. So maybe, maybe it wasn't as bad a place as all that. And it did represent a major investment in public health. But it's something, the, the, the founders of the museum, and in fact, reading one of the consultants who, who helped create the museum, uh, who, who now teaches at Nottingham Trent. Um, and he shared some of the early reports about the museum. And at the time, it was seen as a problem that it was located here. It wasn't in the city centre. And also it was felt that the target market, as we've seen very much as an attractions market, would be a bit put off by having to walk through a down at heel neighbourhood. And they probably wouldn't want to get public transport. Who wants to be on a bus? You know, uh, they probably all drive here. And it was seen, you, know, you could see from the, the beginning, there was a a sort of imagined middle-class museum audience being planned for from, from day one. And, and that's problematic when we actually have a very large audience on our doorstep who could probably get the greatest benefit from the museum. So that was another thing to think about. Anyway, I'll bang on. Um, collection, it's fantastic. I think you're gonna get quite a lot in the collection when we go around and, and Ruth and I are gonna be showing, showing you things. Um, but I, 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 you know, I, I just wanted to flag up that the other the other bit of the museum, of course, was, was a collection which is based mainly on technology, mainly on medical supplies, but the medical supplies with an awful lot of history and context, but which had been collected up until fairly recently in a kind of traditional collector's approach, a systematic approach. Let's get as many examples of, well, in this case, it's a tobacco enema. I don't know how many of those you really want, um, <laughs> just, just enough to keep the sort of Friday night. No, but it, it, it um, you know, it was a sense of, you know, we want every one of this pattern of objects to show the evolution of scalpels, the slightest change, because the surgeons developed, you know, a slightly finer way of holding, which is, you know, it's, it's very, very sort of lauded, but at, at the expense of collecting story and at the expense of collecting context and at the expense of, of seeing, you know, any piece of medical supply, just like a gun, is an item with somebody at each end of it. I think that's, that's, that's very important. And we were thinking of people who are you know, holding one end of it very much. 
And I think, you know, one of the clues to what we want to do is put the people at the other end of it in the picture. And then not just the people at each end, but all of the people around them who are affected who shaped that story. So that was very, very important. And then the other thing which shaped our theory of change was just this thing about where we were. It's very hard to ignore that great big cemetery over the road. And we will talk about it more later, but very briefly. The reason it's there is because of the great sort of health reformer, Robert Baker, who wrote his, 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 his very important report um, on the conditions of, of sort of the industrial poor in Leeds. Uh, and one of the things he highlighted was that the um, parish church graveyards were overflowing. He quite graphically described the bodies sort of flowing out of them and the effluent and disease. And uh, the, he showed on maps how, how you know, outbreaks of various infectious diseases tended to be clustered both in the poorest, most overcrowded housing conditions and around the local uh, burial grounds. Um, but also, at the course of the time, um, dissenters were a very important part of the Industrial Revolution. And if you wanted to be buried in consecrated grounds, you had to pay the local vicar. And that was a fairly big political issue. And the idea of creating uh, somewhere both for dissenters and for uh, Anglican communions to be buried as a major step forward in public health was something proposed by Baker. And as a result, the first of those, the lead cemetery, the history of cemetery was created in 1842. And it's very much a part of the story of the physical development of this city in response to trying to solve the problem of the industrial poor. It's also interesting in that the, the, this lane opposite us, which goes through the descending half of, um, of, the, uh, of the, the cemetery is called Dissenters Avenue. And I think, yeah, if you've got a museum that's opposite to Centres Avenue, it kind of gives you a clue about what you have to do. You know, you don't have to have a wonderful kind of, you know, um, Marxist grasp of semiology just to say, somebody's telling you to do something. Um, in terms of the problems that we had to overcome, so how, is it? We've got 10 minutes. Yeah. In terms of the problems that we had to overcome with the museum, I won't, I won't go into the technical stuff too much, but just I, I sort of wanted one slide to, to sum up, you know, what, what we had to do with the museum. The whole building had been deliberately compartmentalised and divided up to hide its original use, its original volume. So the original um, corridors and the original wards of the workhouse infirmary had all been broken up and the views out to the hospital and the views out to Hare Hills and to the Victoria back to that housing had all been blocked up with with um, you know MDF and, and you know graphics and everywhere you went was little sort of cellular displays to get as many objects and as many words uh, into and as many mannequins <laughs> into the into the display as possible and yeah, people liked it it was very sort of immersive and it was very it was quite private in a way that you never really saw visitors when you were there because but you, you got very, very quickly disorientated in, in the museum. You got very, very quickly divided from the space of the community around you and from other visitors, lost. And our research found that people just didn't, didn't even find the first floor. They really didn't. Something I can't remember, 75% or something of visitors only went to the ground floor. Uh, either we just had such a brilliant museum, that's all they needed, or they, they literally just got fed up or just couldn't, couldn't find the ground. The, the, the first floor. So um, we had a big job just to just to restore the, the building, not because we're sort of, you know, our poncy architects who like to talk to the heritage of the building or anything like that, because we wanted people to see. We wanted people to see where they were going next, to see other visitors, to see out the window, see each other and see the community in the hospital, because it's all part of the story that we tell. And to use the sense of the place, to tell that story a lot more, so that the workhouse no longer was a problem that got in the way of interpretation, but it was part of the story as well, and the community around it. And, and, and the, other, the other thing that we wanted to get away from was this sense, I mean, we still do have some mannequins. People actually like mannequins, but we got rid of an awful lot of them. Um, but we wanted to get away from the sense that, that all, of the, all of the history was being done by other people, because quite clearly, you know, Again, I've worked 34 years in museums. And sometimes you work with collections which are really difficult to make relevant to people. And so, you know, you know, I don't know, just sort of Renaissance silverwork or something like that. And, you know, you have to work pretty hard to get anybody interested in it and start getting sort of, oh, I don't know, it's got a picture of a duck on it. Maybe we could do something. <laughs> but actually, Hells, 
health, just a medicine affects all of us and we all affect it, we all shape it. And all of those discoveries, you know, whether it was Edward Jenner and smallpox or whether it was, um, you know, Alexander Fleming and, and penicillin, actually, there were loads of people who came before um, uh, uh, Edward Jenner. We know, you know, whether it was the Dorset farmer who started you know, administering inoculations or it was the milkmaids who helped sort of Jenner discover, discover the origin of smallpox or whether it was, you know, Mary Hunt who was going by the mouldy melons that helped develop, you know, um, uh, you know, reproducible penicillins. Thank you very much. That's, I like that. That's great. <laughs> I haven't got my glasses, so I hope that's a score. It just says, hooray! <laughs> Larry Hunt, bingo. Uh, you know, all of these people have made huge contributions to, 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 to medicine, and the most important people are us. And we do that. And, and, and our theory of change becomes then rooted in that. Uh, because so many people come to us anecdotally and say, I love your museum. It's where I first got the idea that I should do this, or I should be interested in that. I should be a doctor, I should be a researcher, I should be a nurse, I should... Whatever. So we realise that, you know, number one theory of change is that we build medical capital in people. We give people, especially people who don't have that in their family or social circle, or, 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 or perhaps, you know, haven't got it from school because it hasn't been the best for them. Get it from us. We're the significant other. Uh, and it happens and it inspires people to change. And the second thing that we do is we do it here. And that's so important. And here is a mile long. It's a street that's a mile long from the end of the street here. So the quarry house at the other end, the quarry house, which I discovered the other day, uh, is on the site of where Hitler was planning to put the Reichstag if he ever <laughs> conquered um, Britain, apparently, just because it's right in the middle of Britain. But also, I don't know, in the spirit of the Reichstag, uh, there's this huge postmodern building which holds national departments of, department of social care, and department of health and so on, with a big sort of metal spike on the top. <laughs> People earn an awful lot of money there. They made decisions to affect all of our lives. Along this street, highest average household earning is £30,000. Average earning is £15,000. Average household earning. Now, as I was saying earlier, 88% of women in the immediate area have no economic uh, uh, activities or no money coming at all. That's oppression, isn't it? That's real oppression. So if, we, if we're at the end here of, of, of this street and they're at that end and there, our job has to be to help people get closer and closer and closer, whether it's to participate in, to benefit from, or to get the ear of those people, whether it's to become doctors, researchers, or just inform citizens who can, sorry, I'm not staying in camera, sorry about that, um, or just inform citizens who can make a difference. So that building medical capital becomes absolutely the purpose of what we do. And also just beginning to get away from the idea that health is something singular, and something that's an ideal, but it's something practical, that all of us bring an idea of what healthy and well is. And all of us do that from a point of view of community. So we should become an asset for the community, asset for the community, very important, as you know from Derby, uh, to find its own definition of what well is. Yeah. So we don't tell people, oh, you ought to have better dental hygiene, or you ought to eat more vegetables, or you ought to go and get some exercise. But we work with the community to find out what, what a well community looks like. Now, well community might look like a community with great arts and culture. It might be a community with a great park in it, or it might be a community with good jobs. Uh, and it might have loads of takeaways and people eating junk food everywhere, but it's still a well community. But it's up to the community to decide what that looks like. Um, so that's very, very much part of what we do. I'm going to flick through a couple of these slides because it's just illustrating more of the same. This doctor came to the, the one in the middle, Almas Ahmed, came to the museum when she was eight and decided she wanted to become a doctor. She, she came from working class, uh, community in Bradford, in primary school, and she had a pound in a pocket. She bought a pen from the shop, she went home, she saw her dad, said, I'm going to become a doctor when I grow up, because I went to this museum. He said, when you graduate, I'm going to give you that pen back and you can sign your first prescription. And she did with that. But what's more, the reason she was at this event a couple of years ago, is she's just secured something like 200 million pounds worth of investment for a new um, project to create acid-proof prophylactic medicine to be sold in the subcontinent by people who are the victims of acid throwing as a way as a micro enterprise way of rehabilitating people amazing story from one visit here so that's what we're about creating those opportunities to do that well you're gonna have a tour so i'll just i'll just click through some of these um but we we, we, we created a museum that we hoped could be a base for people to come and work with us to decide what well looks like and work with us to decide what they wanted to do and what they wanted to say in the museum. 
So it's a very collaborative kind of museum. Some of the things we're proud of, of course, are displays, and we'll talk about those when we're walking around them, um, and displays which, which, which put people essentially, but also other things that we've done. We're going to talk about tinkering when we go around and, and, and building those sort of habits of mind. We talk about slightly more contested issues when we go around. We talk about how we collect new technologies and involve people with those, and also how we create a sense of pluralism in a meaningful way. Um, but I just wanted to sort of finish with this slide, really, which is in, in December 2020, we became the first museum in the world to host a COVID vaccination centre. And I, you know, to me, that's, that's where the museum started to, to do something quite quite exciting about being an asset. And a lot of what we've done here is create, I don't know, the, the space, the whiteboard, this toolkit, whatever you want to call it, for these kind of things just to happen. And then sort of sit back um, and see how that, how that happens. Of course, we've got some tactics to make it happen. But the most important thing every, every year are the surprises and what our visitors bring to us about what the future of medicine might have. Oh, it's great. <laughs> I hope you I hope you enjoy it. Um, but you know, it's 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 meant to be something which is provocative. It's also meant to be something that's a bit of fun, and sometimes something that upsets people as well. Um, and but that's what medicine's about. It, it shouldn't always be too safe. So enjoy it, and I'd love to hear what you think of it. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much, Nat. I'm really looking forward to having a look around shortly. Um, I'm just going to get up the next presentation, so just bear with me in a second. Okay, so um, our next presentation, we're sticking on the factory theme um, for this morning. So um, we're going to hear now from Ruth Quinn. Um, she's the programs curator at the factory. Um, she's passionate about telling more inclusive stories about health and well-being and place. And at the factory, um, she works closely with colleagues across the organisation to develop exciting and meaningful programs around medicine and health, past, present and future. Ruth's presentation focuses on co-production and how museums can partner with communities to develop shared stories of place and visions for a healthier future. So I'd like to introduce Ruth. Hello everyone, good morning. I feel like we've uh... It's an honour to be able to have two presentations. Um, I won't keep you too long, hopefully, so we can get around to the business of looking around the museum. Um, so, um, following off from what Nat was talking about, I wanted to kind of focus on the context of kind of arriving at a museum, sort of in the, the shadow of COVID, really, because um, I joined the museum in January. So I'm working on a maternity cover contract covering for my wonderful colleague, Dr. Laura Sellers. Um, so for me, when I kind of arrived here at the factory, I was sort of, yeah, it was 2022, the world was starting to open up again, and sort of very present in my mind was thinking about this, this legacy of, of the pandemic and what we do with it. So at the factory, um, and well, for society in general, really, the pandemic is far from over. So as Nat uh, mentioned before, we were the first museum to have a vaccination hub, and that work has continued, which is really kind of influencing how we think of community and how we respond to the needs of that community. So we got a call from the HS, was it in 2021, December 2021, um, to, Please. this is for the, um, oh, 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 in the call. So 2021, um, the HS needed a space to have a clinic. Um, for long COVID patients. So as part of our lovely redevelopment, we have a community space in the museum called The Court. Um, but because of our close relationship with James's Hospital, every now and again, the NHS are the community that need our space, uh, which I mean, means we have to shift all of our programs around in our wonderful conference center and make more room for our programs. But so for the past 
six months or so that that work has been going on in our building. So we've had people coming in for various studies, various research trials, and that story is continued to be ongoing. So a really important part of my work has been sort of, again, building relationships with people in the NHS, people who do that work to make sense of that story, which is very much an ongoing story. So I've been talking to a wonderful nurse called Claire Favager, who is a research nurse lead for COVID in Leeds, um, just to gain an insight about what it's been like in the pandemic. Because we often learn about the people who designed the vaccine, people, doctors and researchers, but nurses have been very much on that front line of delivering how research response to a pandemic actually works. So what Claire has been doing is when new drugs and things like that have been sort of approved um, for use with COVID patients, she's the person who kind of goes to trials sort of those drugs and builds those relationships with people and then gathers all of that information back. So as a museum, we're kind of slowly sifting through those stories, collecting items, collecting objects, and sort of deciding how, how can we make sense of the pandemic really. Um, and I guess that's kind of one of my provocations for everyone this morning. I think over the past six months, museums have seen a tremendous acceleration in our programmes. We're able to have visitors back. We're sort of getting busy again, and that's really, really great. It's really, really exciting. Um, but in terms of this memory work of responding around, around the pandemic, we need to think about how we can kind of carve out space for that work, which will be slow, it will be careful, it will be thoughtful amidst this sort of drive to, you know, get the schools in, get the visitor numbers back up, because um, it is difficult. Um, but one of the ways that we have been doing that at that great was through our collections online project. So as, as Nat mentioned, our collections, the core of our collection is very much sort of an encyclopedic medical supply collection. So if you go up to our stores, we've got rows and rows of scissors and forceps, which to me were pretty much the same. But if I brought a search in, they would tell me that they were slightly different. Um, but the thing about these collections is we don't necessarily have that many stories related to them. And one of the work that we've got to do now is actually say this, this collection is for everyone. So in order to make that collection for everyone, we need to open it up and invite people in to respond to that. And in our team, we are really passionate about making that community work part of our collections management and documentation because exhibitions and programmes are great, but they have a shelf life, they're ephemeral. And sometimes you'll collect loads of great work, project funding, that project ends, and then all of that work kind of vanishes and disappears. So we want to make that community co-creation part of how we document our collections. So it's put on our CMS system and that information stays with us forever. So this year we trialled a project with Small Small Education Centre in Leeds, and that was designed around getting young people in and connecting with our collections. And Small Small Pride Education with neurodiverse students, so we were sort of working with a new audience, which was slightly outside of mine and Louise, our collections management comfort zone. I do have previous experience of working with neuro neurodiverse audiences at the Mental Health Museum, but it was a very different setting. But, you know, we went for it and we, we did it. Um, so I just wanted to share some of our learning from that project. So that project was largely around digital collections. Um, sort of as museum people, we kind of had this idea of we we're going to get people in, we we're going to show everyone the catalogue, people will be really excited about the catalogue, and then we generate new content. Um, but we found when we sort of first brought people in, we needed to kind of re reassess how we were working, because we had to think about how we make that catalogue meaningful. Because of course, as curators and collections managers, we think catalogues are very exciting. Uh, but to a group of young people in Leeds, maybe a museum catalogue isn't that exciting. <laughs> so you have to come back to that why. Why should people care about that collection? Um, and for us, what we did, we were like, well, we need to get the objects out. So we invite everyone back to the museum, got some objects out from our collection. And we just learned, again, like Esther was saying yesterday, conversations about what those people that we were working with were interested in and how we might engage them with our collection. And kind of as we got those objects out, those kind of stories started to come forward. And I just wanted to share with you a really sort of powerful example of one of those stories that came forward. So we had one student on, on the project whose mother works in the NHS as a doctor. And kind of through most of the project, she was just kind of, uh, the student was kind of weighing us up, kind of figuring out, you know, what we were about. Um, but then we kind of dug into our more contemporary collections and we got this badge out, which was awarded to NHS staff 
following the pandemic in Leeds. This really related to it. So what the student Charlotte decided to do was she was inspired by this object to write a letter to her mom. So we're getting the students to write to write interpretation from the objects. And what she decided to do was to write a letter to her mum, thanking her for her work in the pandemic. And that was really, really powerful for us. Um, and it also challenges this idea of what documentation has to be. As museum professionals and social historians, we can be quite research heavy and think our oh, documentation all has to be about research. And of course, research is very important, particularly with a medical collection. But we can also you know, invite people in to write letters to our collection, because why not? If that's how people want to interact, if that's how we can collect social memory, that can be a really powerful way um, to engage with those stories that are relevant to people's lives. So this is Charlotte's letter. So yeah, we, we, I think we all got a little bit tearful on the project at this point, because <laughs> it was quite an emotional journey that we went on with the students. And what was really, really powerful was that afterwards, Charlotte asked if she could, you know, have the link to the collection online because all of this material was put online so she could show it to her mother and that for us as part of that project was you know it was really powerful and just shows that that value of, of working on these community projects which are small the, the outputs you're going to get it's not going to be you know re, re curating a museum but it kind of it fits within that and it just shows the value of those conversations and those community-led projects um and again, thinking about legacy, it was really important when we were working with more students that after we got to the end of our programme, because it was supporting their study programme, which was designed to get students into work, that we didn't just end there because we didn't want to inspire people with the world of museums and then be like, right, that, that's our project done. So we built a programme um, so that if students wanted to volunteer with us after the project was over, that we could. So this is one of, our, one of the students, Tristan, who knows more about military history than anyone I've ever met. Really, really passionate about history and um, really, really engaged. We asked the students to bring in an object and he brought in a bit of the Berlin Wall. It was pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> and he's one of the students who may well volunteer with us because um, we're really, really proud to be supporting the Curating for Change scheme. We currently have a Curating for Change fellow, Amelia, with us. And part of this project was going to be about those students who joined us who may want to work in museums, we could introduce them to schemes like Curating for Change and kind of support people into working into the museum sector if that's what they want. If they didn't want to work in museums, you know, we've got lots of connections with the NHS. So it was about supporting people um, and developing programmes around them. So the other thing that I wanted to move on and talk about now is kind of picking up some of the themes after the redevelopment. So I wanted to introduce you, anyone who's been to the museum before, We'll be very familiar with Hannah Dyson. So Hannah Dyson is one of the characters which kind of our interpretive approach downstairs is kind of hung on. Um, so Hannah Dyson was a mill worker in Leeds, a young girl, um, worked in the mills and she had an accident when working at the mill and she required emergency surgery. Um, now this is kind of a narrative that you get up and down in industrial museums across the country. It's kind of a way of engaging with that, you know, health and safety and industrial health in the 19th century. So as Nat showed you on his slides, our, our museum before the redevelopment was very mannequin heavy. Uh, and Hannah's story in particular um, was quite graphic because we had these great big mannequins with a surgeon kind of cutting the leg off and it was quite scary. Uh, the Thackeray kind of has its own bizarre kind of Hannah Dyson heritage and it's all right, people will come in, it's visited us 25 years ago and be like, I remember, I remember I saw the operation, you never actually saw the operation, but it made such a powerful response on people um, that there was kind of this big collective memory. So as part of the redevelopment, we changed how we told that story. Um, so when you go downstairs, you will meet Hannah in a lovely video in our entry gallery. Um, and then you go through the Victorian Street and then we commissioned a film about Victorian surgery. Um, and this narrative is very familiar for us. We're kind of used to it. Um, we had um, a visitor recently who came to see us with, with a young child who was actually really upset by Hannah Dyson's story because her child was actually about to go and have surgery. So it was quite difficult to encounter the character of a young girl who was, you know, having surgery in, in the museum when this child herself was going to have surgery. So we had to think about actually how, how can we interpret um, young people's experience of medicine in the museum and you know is this actually upsetting I think for us as you know we're in our old workhouse 
it's a bit of a scary museum. It's understanding that that relationship between when something that is scary for people becomes something which is traumatic for people and how we can make it safe space for people. So if they're going to encounter something which is potentially traumatic, as a museum, we can respond to that with care. And one of the things that the museum is quite good at doing that our, our uh, executive are really good at doing is listening to people. So if someone's got a complaint, now we'll probably call them up and actually you know, try and understand that. So in this case, we responded by putting aside for that in consultation with the mother so that people knew when they came into the gallery what to expect. Now, this sign is very much a placeholder. We'll be thinking about kind of more work we can do around our interpretation of Hannah Dyson's story, but it just kind of shows the value of listening to people and considering how you engage with difficult subjects. Because um, medicine can be quite a lot of things for people. It can be about healing, it can be very joyful, it can be very funny. We definitely have a good laugh in the office at some rude things we find in our collection. Um, <laughs> but also, it's really important to remember that medicine can be quite traumatic. Um, it's about pain, it can be about death, and it can be about a lot of suffering. And in society, we are living in the aftermath of a global pandemic. People have a lot of unresolved trauma around medicine. And when they come to the museum, they bring that trauma with them. And we're increasingly thinking about how can we create safe spaces for people to, you know, encounter things like difficult because medicine is difficult but how can we respond to that in a caring way so people feel seen and people feel heard and people have a good visit so this is the response that we got from that visitor who came back to the museum saw the signs felt better and had a lovely time doing some activities in the museum because that's really important because you know we've developed a new family learning area in the museum which you'll see very shortly and we're really really passionate about making sure that those younger audiences have a good time. So I wanted to close my presentation today with thinking about our periods exhibition. Um, so in earlier this year, uh, we were really, really excited to work with the Vagina Museum to deliver an exhibition, which was all about periods. Um, and this was a really exciting time for us to kind of develop and strengthen some of those co-production approaches when it came to working with exhibitions. Uh, so to develop this exhibition, we had to consider how we see the Vagina Museum or an institution in London and we're an institution in Leeds. How can we take a touring exhibition from them that kind of makes sense to our communities? So what we did was we ran a series of workshops with the, an organisation called Freedom for Girls who tackle, tackle period poverty. And we commissioned a work of art and an artwork, an artwork to kind of create work. And that was really powerful because the group met. We did some sewing, we created this highly you know, personal tapestry, which went on display in the gallery as part of the exhibition. But this project also had a life beyond just you know, creating material for display, because the group were also an activist group, so they made period products, reusable period products, and they still continue to meet to sew these, these period products, because they also built those relationships through the exhibition. Uh, we also made the decision to collect sanitary products that we would uh, make available free in our museum and we're continuing to do that. I mean, we've had over 400 school children this week so our, our sanitary bins may have been, <laughs> been picked through but it's thinking about obviously this <coughs> exhibition dealt with themes that are very real to our community and how can we be a space that's welcoming for our community? How can we tackle period poverty in our museum as well? So that's a picture of the exhibition and it had a very sort of very powerful artwork and a very strong visual identity. Uh, which people really responded to. But one of the challenges uh, of this exhibition was definitely managing those audience responses. Because the Vagina Museum obviously has a very strong brand, very strong profile. People who visit that museum expect to deal with, you know, menstruation, sex and gender. People don't necessarily expect that from the Thackeray Museum of Medicine. <laughs> Um, even though menstruation is very much part of life, people can kind of respond quite strongly to some of the themes in the exhibition, which was kind of really demonstrated by the very different feedback we got to the same exhibition. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of kind of bringing this work forward, we'll be kind of thinking about how we can meet audiences halfway, because at the fact we were, we're very much committed to developing an inclusive organisation. You know, when we talk about non-binary people, intersex people, trans people, it's not that we're erasing anyone, we're including people, but we want to be able to. Sadly, because of the highly polarised media landscape that we're operating in, people can have quite strong reactions. And it's about how we kind of 
bring people in and include people in a space that feels safe for everyone. Um, so that's something that we're going to be thinking about as we take our programmes forward. Um, so yes, thank you very much for listening. Um, and I look forward to taking you around the museum very shortly. Thank you.